is how nuclear energy is powering the AI revolution. I am joined by one of the key players in this new generation, uh, new generation of, of nuclear energy and, and the race that's going on. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and then we'll get right in. Can you guys hear me? Is this live? Yeah, good. Okay. Awesome. So uh, I'm Jacob DeWitt. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Oaklo, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about, but building next generation small nuclear power plants. Uh, and I'm Caroline Cochran. I'm Caroline Cochran, the co-founder. I think you kind of angle it <laughs> like this. Yeah. I'm thinking it's not on. Um, uh, it wasn't on. Yeah, it wasn't on. I'm Carolyn Cochran, the co-founder and COO of Oaklo. Um, happy to be here. Thanks for having us. So when we think about scaling AI, so much of it kind of goes to uh, the, the, the startups in the space. Nuclear energy is a big part of this narrative. And, and my question to you is, you know, Sam Altman has said that there are two things that really need to happen. You need uh, better chips than what's out there today. You need more of them and you need more energy. And, and so he invested in two startups in this space, yours, which focuses on fission and that type of nuclear energy. And then you've also got Helion Energy, which is doing fusion. So I guess my question is, why fission? not fusion why did he choose you like just kind of set the scene for us here yeah I think it's really about both actually um, at the end of the day I think one thing that sticks out when you look at the opportunities around large well just the huge need for energy at massive scale on s for so many reasons independent of AI and AI just builds on that uh, you need a lot of energy you're gonna need as much as you can possibly get and so having a couple shots on goal that have the potential to be massively scalable in a globally meaningful way it kind of leads you to look at you know fission and fusion so I think Sam saw the opportunity in both uh, obviously he views them as he said many times in a complimentary sense you know Fission works today, we know that, that's awesome, so we can scale. Uh, there's different challenges and hurdles there, and then you know, Fusion has some work to do to see if we can really get it to work, and then there's the different hurdles associated with that. But either way, the opportunity space is mind-bogglingly large, so huge amounts of energy are gonna be needed. Um, and I think that's how Sam looks at it, is we just need as much as we can get as quickly as we can get. And Caroline, how's it been working with Sam? Uh, yeah, everybody you know, thinks of OpenAI and, and that side of, of the work that he does, but how, how invested is he in the daily operations of what you're doing at Oaklo? Yeah, I think it's been it's been a uh, a really incredible experience to know have known him for these like ten years, and um, you know I think like Jake alluded to, he's just a very visionary person. He's helped us think that way too. Um, you know, uh, to add on to what Jake was saying, I think you know looking forward to AI, seeing energy as the fundamental limiter or, or enabler of it, as you're kind of introing, and just realizing that even the cost of AI may roughly approximate the cost of energy in the future. I think he's been thinking about that for so long and he's helped us think about how to you know start and run this company as well yeah and I, and I think that in terms of nuclear like Jake you've been working in this space since you were 16 years old um, why is this the answer you've got names like Bezos and Gates and Sam and so many like Silicon Valley funds that are specifically investing in nuclear power is that like the answer for AI or why is it nuclear not something else I do think it is the answer. I mean, I think it's the answer for so much of what we're trying to do on an energy front, period. At the end of the day, there's a couple of things that stand out to me. First of all, when you split an atom of uranium, you produce about... Are you about to pull uranium I'm out of your jacket pocket? Some uranium out of the pocket. <laughs> I told you I'd bring it. Uh, so uh, when you split an atom of uranium, right, you produce about 50 million times more energy than when you combust the molecule of like a hydrocarbon. Wait, is that safe? Totally safe. <laughs> That's why I have it on my person. I, I, yeah, okay. I carry it around everywhere I go, pretty much. Um, 10 grams of uranium metal. Uh, it, it's an incredible technology, right? It's like out of science fiction. It's why I fell in love with it when I was a kid. Uh, on top of that, though, it's massively scalable. It uses the fewest materials per megawatt hour of any energy source we have, right? And that means literally the fewest kilograms of steel, of copper, of concrete, of fuel, so on and so forth, per megawatt hour of energy it generates. It should, therefore, be the most scalable, cheapest source of energy you have. So it is a fundamental unlock. And the other thing is when you think about AI, when you think about sort of a continued drive towards electrification and I'll use the term digitalization, um, you need power that's 24-7, that's reliable, and you really want it to be clean and sustainable, and you need it to be able to be massively scalable. Uh, and that's something that Fission really does well. Um, it wants to run 24-7, it's clean, it's scalable, it can be very, very affordable. And when you have the lowest material footprint, that also means you have the lowest impact on the environment. So it actually works really, really well when we think about what an electrified future really means. Now, Caroline, you run operations at the company, and you guys have been around since, what, 2013? You, it's 11 years? And it's just, when you think about AI, it's this unregulated space. You can move pretty quickly. You can scale very quickly, and that's what we've been seeing. When you think about nuclear, my 
goodness, the hurdles you must have been and continue to face. Like you're, I know you've got that first site in Eastern Idaho, uh, not live yet. It's been in production. You spent 11 years at this working with regulators, working to like do all of the operational things that kind of come in, that come before you launch a reactor. Walk me through how difficult that has been because it seems like there are just so many barriers to entry into this market. Yeah. Um, in, in one sense, yeah, it's been so long, but in another sense, we're now at this cusp of like so many things happening. So it's kind of interesting. It's like really, really slow until it's insanely fast. And I think that has to do with, you know, the regulatory path is hard and it just takes time. And uh, so we, we, especially because the regulator really is set up or has history in regulating what's called water-cooled reactors. So these large water-cooled reactors you see across the country and we're this small using inherently safe characteristics, um, reactor that's called a fast reactor that uses metal fuel. And so it's just different from top to bottom from anything they've seen before. So we really ha felt like we had to start right away. And we did really like the first year after our um, seed round, we started engaging the regulator on a formal basis and just you know, doing a pilot. You know, we started engaging with them in 2016. We did a pilot application in 2018. We did another application in 2020, which was doubly hard because of the pandemic. And uh, now we're working on, on yet another. But I think like this is where we see like so much of the paved the way um, for all of that. And now we're working with many customers on many sites that were you know just still you know potential customers. And so it's a really exciting time for us. Yeah, and I, I guess that's one thing that I, I should have had us explain a little bit earlier. So you have a smaller footprint. What, what, what the site that we're talking about in Idaho is a 15 megawatt facility. It's a different type of reactor than what you would think of in like the heyday of nuclear and back in the 1970s in the U.S. So explain why the smaller reactor makes more sense uh, and what, what you're doing technologically speaking that is just like different and more innovative than what we've seen in the past. Yeah, I think one of the things that kind of was a root for how we built the company and started it came from me having kind of, I guess, the odd but cool opportunity of starting very young in the space and getting a chance to touch a bunch of different facets in the industry. I was drawn to thinking about what was next. Um, it's a mix of that, but what I really realized in that path was it was more about doing things in a new way to deliver what was next with respect to next generation kind of nuclear technologies. So what we're working on is, is building on a wonderful legacy of liquid metal cooled fast reactors. That's kind of techno jargon to basically say a system that runs using liquid met metal as a coolant. Uh, it's a wonderfully capable coolant. It runs at high temperatures without being pressurized, compatible with common materials used in many other industries. So it taps into already operating supply chains at scale. That's very important. It also has the features Caroline talked about, allowing you to have a simplified kind of safety case. You put the physics of the system on your side, uh, so it's a physics safe design. That allows you to simplify the plant, further kind of reduce costs, and make it just a more elegant overall basically technology solution um, and then package that with a business model that matches what people actually want. This is one thing I saw in nuclear was the typical business model of, of, of how the industry would work, which basically entailed designing the power plant to like something between 50 and 80 percent completion and then trying to find customers give you like a couple hundred million dollars to do the rest of your work. <laughs> just a very high friction, uh, doesn't really match with what people want. So we found though there were a lot of people who really want to buy the wonderful energy that a nuclear system can make that's clean, that's reliable, that's affordable, that's scalable, that's you know, kind of always there. Um, uh, you just got to make it easy for them to buy. So we took a different approach on the business model where we design, own, operate, sell power through long-term power purchase agreements. That solves a lot of that. Um, so couple that with the technology and then the others are the size, like you said. We're at 15 megawatts to start, uh, a great starting point for a lot of markets, works really well with a lot of data center opportunities as we start here, but it's not where we end, right? It's a starting point because we wanted to be as small as we could to keep capital low to go from start to full power, like first sort of operating power, uh, as opposed to what typically happens in nuclear, which makes that a multi-billion dollar proposition and very difficult to get off the ground. This allowed us to tackle this in a totally different way, kind of re-engineer the way a nuclear organization typically operates, which has allowed us to achieve somewhat unprecedented kind of capital efficiency, hit milestones in all sorts of ways. Taps really well into, I would say, I guess I'd call it kind of, you know, the startup Silicon Valley ecosystem that like, you know, is part of what I think attracted Sam to us, us to him and all that, so. And, and a part of your design is also that you're using leftover nuclear waste from the government. Walk me through that side of how, yeah. it, <laughs> how no, it's, it's different. It's, how it's so <laughs> wild to think about this. I, it was one of my favorite things, right? So literally today's nuclear power plants, they use about 5% of the fuel that goes into them when they're in the reactor. What that means, what comes out is, we think of as nuclear waste, it's really just barely slightly used nuclear fuel. Uh, more than 90% of that fuel remains unused and it's extractable. So you can put it through recycling technologies that pull out the unused fuel and then use that to power our reactor. What that means then is now you're able to extract 
the incredible amount of energy reserve that is now otherwise considered sort of in waste. There's literally enough energy content in the nuclear, the used fuel in this country alone, which for numbers, it's about 90,000 metric tons by volume that would fit in something like a super Walmart. There's enough energy content in that to power the entire United States electric energy needs for 150 years. And then when you scale that forward, I mean, well, every year our operating plants produce enough fuel through waste to power the country for four more years. And at scale, this is what gets me particularly excited. This is truly, and, and by the way, all that technology has been demonstrated. This plant in Idaho uh, that we derive our legacy from, yes, it's new technology, this liquid sodium cooled fast reactor, but it's kind of not. It, it, it was starting to get developed out of the Manhattan Project. We as a society have built more than 25 of these plants, accrued more than 400 combined reactor years of operational experience. We've shown how it works. We've shown also how we learned what doesn't work, but we really successfully learned kind of what works through demonstrations in Washington State and Idaho. Idaho is where we're building our first plant that builds directly off the legacy of that plant there, and it demonstrated the ability to recycle waste. And, and the thing that gets me excited about that is, yes, that's cool about the waste side, but it also drops the cost of energy because the fuel becomes a lot cheaper when you recycle it. And then at a scalable level, think about this. We have a technology that's demonstrated on the reactor side and the recycling side. Truly, we know how it works. There's no science risk. We know how this stuff works. That you can use to tap into the heavy metal reserves on this planet that we know are accessible and power the entire planet's energy needs for a 10 billion person planet for several billion years. I mean, you effectively have a, a, a terminal energy and climate solution. That's pretty motivating, right? Um, which is pretty cool. And you called this like the silver bullet that's right in front of us. Why haven't people capitalized on it before? Yeah, it's a funny thing. Like, it is truly a silver bullet. Uh, <laughs> like, it works. People are like, oh, there's no silver bullet to climate. Yeah, there actually is. Um, I think there's a couple major reasons, but largely distill and collapse into kind of the one underlying one, which was it was a technology that when it was ready to come out to market, starting in the sort of mid 90s the in, the kind of the legacy industry was taking it forward under the same business model that they had done other things in the past which meant they were coming up with things that didn't really work um, and so sorry from a business model perspective so they took something that was proven at 20 megawatts they scaled it to 300 megawatts they introduced new technologies so they could kind of stay eligible for research and you know development kind of government funding they weren't really focused on productizing it. And they wrapped all that in that old business model that nobody wanted. So even if you have a silver bullet, but nobody wants it, because you make it in a way that nobody can buy or will buy, it doesn't do anything. So our view is to try to tackle those fundamental limiters and just go. And you know, Caroline, I feel like you had to break through a lot of existing market paradigm as you entered this space. Uh, you know, Jake was just talking about like the legacy nuclear players. How has that been navigating it? Because I mean, historically, I feel like there have been these like huge uh, recurring costs, which is a good thing for existing players, a you know, guaranteed uh, power supply contract. So were people hostile to you entering this market? I, I think early on, um, there's just kind of an attitude of, of um, how to put it. I think like we were a shiny object or kind of cute, and I think it was not really a threat, and I think it was interesting to people. So I think starting off, that was kind of the attitude. Um, but I'd say, yeah, I think there's there's a kind of a natural um, edginess between this kind of new model and, and kind of the old one. But I think like maybe one of the best analogies is between us and kind of other hard tech companies like SpaceX, where like, uh, you know, I think there was a lot of government collaboration there, but there's, um, you know, I think, uh, shows that you can enter an industry where people thought you simply can't do anything without billions in government funding. And they showed how you can be scrappy and do that. And I think that's kind of an analogous to what we're doing here. So we've mentioned this site in eastern Idaho where you uh, like you first set up shop. You're obviously having conversations with uh, you know people across the country. You're also lo looking to go public pretty soon via SPAC. Walk me through next steps for you and how you're thinking strategically like about locations where you want to launch. Yeah, so we've we've got four four areas that we've really announced. Uh, sorry, that was we've got four plants that we've announced. Um, we've talked about Idaho, two in Ohio, one in Alaska. Um, there's more coming, which we're excited about. It's kind of at this inflection point now where we're moving into sort of ex like scale up and delivery and building out some of our infrastructure to deliver on these plants and the many more that are accruing in our pipeline. Um, and so uh, it kind of made sense if the right opportunity presented itself to to find a path to public because our business model has the opportunity to really build off of project finance models where I can take my long-term power purchase agreement and go take that into the project finance markets, just like renewables have shown work really, really well and tap into that. But doing that as a public company is far more scalable than as a private company. So we saw that that opportunity, if we could find the right opportunity, <laughs> would be a great one. Uh, and you know, I guess very fortunately and excitingly, we did see that, which 
somewhat maybe almost ironically was Sam Altman's SPAC because we had never talked to him about that. Um, and then all of a sudden it was like, oh, wow, that actually literally checks all the boxes we want to see. So also kind of changes some of the overhang that SPACs have had. It's a simple structure. It has all those kind of benefits, handle long lockups. It's about capitalizing for the company to grow and scale, not about, you know, cashing out or anything like that, because we're moving into this exciting kind of inflection stage for growth. And then it really, I think what it's turning into is an opportunity to just kind of scale as quickly as reasonably possible built around sort of what we're seeing in the order book side what's happening in the in the in the ai space and the data center space is mind-boggling right um like i think one of the things we've seen is there's a lot of excitement we have you know prospective customers that are coming to the table there the energy needs are first of all they're very energy constrained in a lot of markets that they want to grow in there's just not energy on the grid for them to find you places like texas or virginia arizona i mean a lot of places pretty much everywhere almost so they want and they want to find ways to build these things and uh, they need the power for it and the other thing that's come forward obviously is what ai has brought to the table in the last year and a half which has fundamentally, I think, broken almost all of their models for what their energy needs are going to be going forward. Because I think the numbers are so incredibly large that it's just, it, it breaks their models. Um, and so they're going to need so much energy in so many areas. And it needs to be effectively 24-7 reliable power. And they want it to be clean and scalable. And we're sized in a manner intentionally, by the way, to match very well with what they're doing. We have a 15 megawatt offering. We also have a 50, a 50 megawatt offering. We might go a little bit bigger over time, but those work pretty well to kind of match how data centers get built out block by block. And a cool thing, too, is because of our sizing, we can offer the N plus one reliability that they want, that they need to see. So it really is like a, a I mean, the boom that's happening here is going to be pulling this pulling us along in a lot of cool ways. That's a really silly way of saying we're excited to ride the AI sort of energy wave. <laughs> and this is like, I mean, this is before you've got LLMs integrated into search engines. Like, I just can't even imagine how quickly the need for power is going to scale. And you just, I mean, you guys, like you said, Caroline, earlier, like you're actually moving quite quickly <laughs> in this space, um, you know, 11 years in. And, and it's just one of those things where like, I imagine like those regulatory hoops are really tough. Another question that I have for you, security. Like so many of these data centers uh, work with three letter government agencies and you guys are not taking funding from the government and you're kind of doing things on your own. How are you bracing for like physical EMP attacks or like other cybersecurity threats? It, it seems like a lot to navigate. Yeah, or either, yeah, either one of you, you William. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yes, data centers need not some of them have especially uh, stringent needs for security, um, for resili you might also call it resilience or kind of, um, yeah, the EMP resilience as well. Um, so what we're, we're seeing is we can offer them that kind of resilience because of different measures that you can take. But one of the key features that allows us to be able to do that inherently is because the technology that we're working with actually allows for when it's inherently safe, like it can't melt down, then there's also limits to what you know bad actors can do. Um, but obviously, uh, the other piece to that is just making sure the power stays on regardless of any radiological thing. So yeah. we've been working with them on how to ensure that and offer that product. And real quick, last question. I know we've been focusing on AI as your chief buyer. Um, where else are you seeing customer interest? Yeah, I think you have a massive trend that's been going on for broad electrification in the last several years that I think really got picked up with the Infrastructure Act and sort of the um, Inflation Reduction Act that really drove forward a significant you know, investments and incentives to, to basically decarbonize everything we can, ranging from, and that, that's just going to put a lot more demand for electric power on the grid. I, I saw, and I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but um, just the amount of energy needed to sort of electrify San Francisco as a back of the envelope case study is, 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 is several gigawatts just to electrify heating and cooking and domestic use of that as well as transit. So, uh, and that's one municipality and that's in some ways a smaller footprint municipality than a lot of others that are going to take a lot more to do that with. But you see that also going in into industrial processes. So a lot of exciting, exciting opportunities on sort of the industrial side, um, opportunities obviously to provide power, uh, including into like, um, master plan community development where we can think about energy resilience and price stability, something nuclear affords in a very favorable way as a California, resident who's seen my power bills go up by over 50 percent in the last few years I'm not saddened by that idea for you know future opportunities but also I think uh, you know the military has some opportunities you know around making sure there's resilience on their bases for power generation and power consumption um, so I think it kind of touches on everything I mean energy is one of the most fundamental inputs into our life right so like as we move to a world where we're retiring assets where we're scaling energy use we're electrifying we want clean energy we want it reliable we want it affordable I mean it's, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, thank you, Jake, Caroline from the Oclo team, and thank you to the Lively and Grit Daily House for having us and everyone in the audience here. Thank you.